you so much, Peter, for having me and for the invitation. And as my first question would be, uh, can you tell us something about yourself? Why did you, uh, how motivated you were uh, by choosing the IT sector and especially the artificial intelligence whatsoever? Yes, well, it is actually very funny because uh, I'm kind of, uh, let's say, it's not very peculiar to see uh, somebody like me in this field. First of all, because I am a woman, there are not so many women in tech and especially in AI. And secondly, because I'm a blonde. <laughs> Sorry. But uh, yeah, so uh, coming back to your question, I... Uh, I was always like uh, that, this nerdy kid and I was always very curious and wanted to change the world. And um, I know that I'm talking platitudes here, but just wanna say that I think that this curiosity uh, drove me into this direction. And I, um, I chose the tech field accidentally. I wanted to go to an Ivy League school and work in research and do something meaningful for the world. But unfortunately due to some unpredictable events, I, um, I could not uh, go, so I, I enrolled in a Polytechnic Institute in my city, and it's there where I discovered AI. It was over 17 years ago when AI at that time, at least in uh, my city and in my country, was something that almost nobody heard about, and they were all very eager that they discovered the cloud. <laughs> so I... Um, I uh, remember going to my first, uh, my first um, class in AI and I found it like, okay, I said, this is something that I really need to know more on, so I focused on that. So I was the one that I went to my professor and I uh, asked him to join his team, even though that I was just in the beginning. So for 11 years, I was a researcher in academia in AI. And um, uh, following, I... Um, I gave up the academic part and then I started my own company, a startup in AI. And I did that because after I worked in this field, let's just say that um, I worked as a researcher, so I didn't have a lot of practical applications and I wanted to do something practical. And I didn't find any company at that time that was looking for AI they didn't know what it is about. So I said, okay, if the mountain doesn't come to Mohammed, I'll go to the mountain. So I created my own AI, and uh, I tried to find a practical application, and I managed to win a contest uh, organized by the Dubai Ministry of Tourism at that time, because they were very interested in innovation. And this happened like six years ago, and I won uh, the competition in, uh, for innovation in tourism uh, industry in, uh, in Dubai. Then I sold my startup and I started working with companies, governments. That's how I met actually Peter because I was working uh, for some smart city solutions. And now I have my own company, research company and development in AI. Well, thank you. Well, as an AI expert, uh, we have heard about supercomputers, all kinds of AI over here as well. And uh, what is your take on uh, the AI or the coming AI outsmarting the human mind. Uh, some people are or could be afraid of losing jobs, maybe losing uh, privacy, security, and uh, some of us have remembered a movie called Terminator where uh, we could lose our lives to, to AI as well. So what about this field? Okay, so I heard so many fantastic presentations to today about uh, innovation, and I just want to stress that it is important to have innovation, but also we have to be responsible for what we are creating. And to answer your question, uh, yes, I think that, uh, let's just say that AI will outsmart the, the human mind. It is not a question of we, if, it's a question of when and how. And I uh, don't want to sound controversial, but um, as you can see, we already have intelligence um, that it's done by computers. If we look at the concept of intelligence, which is actually solve complex problems, we already have some degree of complexity in the way uh, AI and computers approach problems. When we talk about creativity, we already know, and most of us use DALI and, um, and other tools, and we can see that computers can also be creative. Okay, and they will improve in time. So what does 
stop us to, to go a step further and reach like general AI or super intelligence? Well, let's just say that for now, this is not the case, but I repeat, for now. And why? Because the, the human mind is still a mystery. So if we are now to look from the perspective of an AI towards the way the human mind um, uh, functions, it doesn't know. And we also don't know, because why? Because thoughts are actually neurobiological processes. And even neuroscientists and even the biggest experts in this field, they don't know how they work about. And um, the thing is that we only have a simulation of the human mind. I repeat, a simulation, which is our interpretation of the way the human mind works. It's not a duplication. And we give only this interpretation to the machine. During machines, machines that think are not to be found in nature. They are found in the interpretation that we give in nature. And here is the problem of consciousness. Consciousness is something that we don't know anything about. And consciousness is subjective, while science is objective. Although we managed so far to put in computational forms a lot of the, let's say, high-level reasoning, we didn't manage to find an understanding for consciousness. And um, I worked in this field, and I can say that um, during my PhD, I did research, and the subjects that I follow was um, working on um, reasoning systems for uh, AI agents, basically making AI agents think as human. So what I can tell you is that I gave up. Why I gave up? Because there is just a limitation until us as scientists can go. And um, there is a saying that Noam Chomsky uh, mentioned once, and I, and I totally agree with him. So when there is something that we don't have an understanding about, we first give it to physicists. Physicists try to solve it, and they, if they don't know, they give it to chemists. Then the chemist, OK, he looks at it and said, OK, I don't know. I give it to the biologist. And when the uh, biologist doesn't know, what do they do? They give it to the philosopher. And when the philosopher doesn't know, they give it to the to the uh, author of a uh, um, science fiction play. So basically, we are there. So we are only at the philosophical level understanding how the human mind works. And you know what is the job of the future? It is not a, an AI expert. It is not a developer. It is a philosopher. Because actually, they are the ones that are going to teach us how to implement the human mind in a computer. And Google and the big ones, already they use philosopher. And I recently watched a course from John Searle, which is amazing. And I totally recommend you to look at it from Google. And he was explaining exactly this. So I just want to give you a couple of, uh, of ideas here about what our mind works from a philosoph philosophical ex um, perspective. Sorry for that. OK, so basically, as I said, we have our um, perception of the world. And here, some of the philosophers, and uh, I recommend David Hume, which is an 18th century philosopher that tried to understand the human mind. And it's actually it's the closest to which we have become you know, in understanding the thought process. And he was explaining in uh, his work called Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding that we have perceptions of the world, perceptions under the form of impressions, which is what our mind experiences. It's like sensations. And then we have like some images of these impressions, which are our thoughts and ideas. It's like impressions are felt here, and then the thoughts and ideas, they are taught in our mind. OK, so we have this, these two categories of ideas. And these ideas actually are encapsulated in our own world. So we have our own world to which we have access, it, uh, access to it with our mind. And then we have the real world. Well, we have only an indirect access to the real world. And what we see in the real world, the things that we see we actually project them in our world of ideas. And these projections, sometimes they are, let's say, incorrect, or they are distorted. So basically, we need to correct them. 
And how do we correct this distortion? Well, with self-awareness. Okay, and there is something that Rene Descartes said, uh, said on, on this topic, on the separation of the real world and of the mind, uh, mind world and of, of our thoughts world, it's that there is this disconnection between, between these worlds. And we have our own consciousness. And our own consciousness and one consciousness implies one's, uh, one's existence. And do you find something here that is quite uh, resembling or known? Well, it's exactly cogito ergo sum. So this means I think, therefore I am. So you see, consciousness, it's subjective. And we still couldn't find a computational form to express, this, to express it. And philosophers say that we might never will. But what I can say is that for sure, the human mind, the perverse human mind, will definitely try to create a copy of it even if they don't understand it. And we will have in the future some monsters of AI that will be these copies of our own human minds, but without understanding humanity. And does this scenario look familiar a little bit? Well, it's exactly the book Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, in which Victor Frankenstein created its monster based on his quest for finding the meaning of life and death, and he actually left aside any moral, any ethics in order to do that. And I can guarantee that this will happen, unfortunately. And the problem, it's not only with uh, the, the consciousness part, but with the morality part that lies beneath it. And for example, we have, and I have also worked, and we, we, we have already AI that has to have some certain understanding of moral and ethics. Okay, not the AI that we use in machine learning or in, or in um, um, computer vision, but for example, the self-driving cars. We already saw a lot of accidents that happened by, uh, by Tesla cars, and we don't know why this is happening. Well, it's because the AI doesn't have a moral and an ethic system there. So that's why we need to we create one. And this is difficult because these are human-centric constructs. And we, it's hard to put this in an AI. And trust me, I, I tried. So uh, basically, this is a problem. And of course, then there is the problem of uh, the meaning of life after the AI will become more intelligent and more powerful than the human mind. And definitely the alignment problem, which is trying to have the AI being friendly and not kill us. And there is uh, just, um, um, let's say there are some, some books on this. And I totally recommend like super intelligence or uh, like the coherent uh, extrapolal um, vo velocity of, uh, of, um, uh, of a scientist. In, um, in the US that tried to create some arguments in, uh, regarding this. But what I can say, finally, is that uh, computers and AI kind of uh, help us understand what it means to be human. And now, although there are like these Turing tests done to understand like how AI functions, there are also some competitions that actually try to discover the most human human. And there is this um, famous one, Brian Christian, who wrote a book about his experience winning this competition in 2009. And now he wrote another book, The Lyman Problem, to try to explain how we can avoid for the AI to kind of uh, um, destroy us or kill us or uh, God knows what. So. I, I recommend you um, reading it and definitely try to, to read some philosophy because this is what it's going to be needed in the future. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I really hate to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs>